few people trickling in. Uh, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. And it's sunny out, first sunny day, so I really appreciate you coming on a sunny, first sunny day, because I know a lot of people are hoping to be outside. Um, this is Melanie Little and Pat Vincent, and Pat is a graduate of Lansing, 1968. <laughs> so welcome back to Pat. It's a little different, uh, she was saying, but um, so she, but she's certainly happy to be here. So please uh, ask any questions. You'll go, go ahead and get started. And there's um, lots of resources in the back. One thing I wanted to um, point out is we have a mental health uh, counseling department in Lansing and they created a really nice brochure really outlining what they do, how to access them, and um, other resources in the, in the county as well. So welcome and thank you. Thank you for inviting us to be with you guys tonight. Um, I know we had to reschedule this presentation, so it's really exciting to see all these faces in the room. Sometimes we lose some folks and we have to switch dates, so thank you all for being here. Um, so again, my name is Melanie Little, and this is Pat Vincent. Pat Vincent, yes, I, as she um, said, I agree. <laughs> if you would have said 50 years ago I would be standing here talking about Mental Health 101, I would have never believed it. But here I am, celebrating my 50th um, reunion this last summer. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Lansing has come along with uh, some beautiful years, isn't it? Beautiful. Last time I was in this room, it was the orchestra room. Mm -hmm. But thank you again for all coming. Yes. So Pat directs our Family Support Services program. She works very directly with a lot of parents who may have a child who is dealing with a mental health disorder or who may be dealing with some issues in their family as a result of their own mental health issues. Um, and I provide a lot of our youth peer support services and do <coughs> a lot of our youth education programming in the community. Um, so we're here from the Mental Health Association in Tompkins County. Um, we're a local community-based nonprofit organization. Um, and this is Mental Health and Wellness 101. Um, so just to give you a little more information about, oh, oh no, is my clicker not gonna work? Oh, it's been a day of tech adventures. Okay, <laughs> we're working. Um, so, Mental Health and Wellness 101 was developed by the Mental Health Association in New York State, which is our parent organization. Um, so, MHA New York State is a non for profit organization that works to end the stigma against mental illness <coughs> and to promote mental health and wellness in New York State. Um, so, I assume that most of you are probably aware that New York State recently passed a law mandating mental health education in health classes. Um, and we think this is a huge victory. Um, and MHA New York State was actually a really strong advocate for that change in policy and helped to make that happen. Um, so we at the MHA in Tompkins County are an affiliate of MHA New York State. So our mission, um, in cooperation with the MHA in New York State and Mental Health America, which is our nationwide uh, parent organization, our goal is to develop and coordinate a citizens movement with participation from recipients of mental health services. <coughs> to work towards empowering individuals, families, and groups through advocacy, provision of services which promote mental health, and education and information to the general public about mental health issues. So we really have a holistic vision, right? Um, we want to make sure that people who receive these services are having their voices heard and how these things roll out. And we really believe that as a community, we all can benefit from having this information, whether it be supporting ourselves or supporting the people in our lives. So today, what's that? Oh yeah, <coughs> there's a little bell. You want to talk about the bell? Yeah, well, we, we, initially we had a bell. So the bell over there is our symbol. And just to give you a little history about that is there was <clears throat> this gentleman who ended up spending some time in a institution way back in the day. But he was one of the fortunate ones who was able to get out. And after he was released, and after he spent time studying, he wrote several books. <clears throat> and he also was very implemental, instrumental in getting some of the things from some of the institutions, <clears throat> the shackles, the chains, uh, any other things. They brought them all together, and they melted them down. And they made this big bell that we keep in Albany. 
as our symbol of mental health. <clears throat> so that's, that's a great historic, we like to tell that story. It's, mm -hmm. it's very dear to our hearts that this gentleman made it so much better for, yeah. for the population dealing with, with mental illness. Yeah, it's sort of a physical representation of this transition we've gone through as a culture from locking people away and horribly mistreating them to really having hope for recovery and independence and living a fulfilling life despite a mental illness, right? Um, so our goals today, um, this truly is a 101 course, right? Um, so all of us in the room are probably coming in with different levels of understanding, different backgrounds about these topics. So our goal today is to develop sort of a consistent understanding among us about mental health as a continuum and its role as an integral part of overall health, right? Our brain does not exist outside of our bodies, right? That'd be kind of weird and gross. Um, it's inside of our bodies, right? It impacts all of our health and well-being. Um, we're going to try to understand the prevalence of mental health problems and their impact on people in our communities. We're going to learn a little bit about some signs and symptoms and some warning signs that might let us know that either ourselves or someone we care about could be developing one of these issues. Um, and we're going to look at some risk, risk factors and protective factors that could make someone more or less likely to develop a mental health issue. Um, and to wrap up, we'll be looking at some treatment and support options and the process of recovery. Um, for a really long time in the mental health system, recovery was not talked about. Right? Um, for a very long time, mental health issues were looked at as permanent, static conditions, lock a person away and throw away the key and forget about them. Right? What we know now, and what I think people with lived experience with mental health issues have known for a long time, is that recovery is possible. Um, we really believe that for every single person who's dealing with a mental health issue, with the right treatment and the right support, they can find some semblance of recovery. Whether that means that their symptoms have gone away entirely, or that they still deal with their symptoms but are able to live a rich and fulfilling life in spite of them. Also, um, at the end, I did give you, we brought our um, PowerPoint presentation is there so you don't, for any time you want an easy reading at night, it's there. With the exception is that when we're doing Mental Health 101, I, we go around to different venues. And so there's going to be a little difference in your slides because I put in, I put in a little extra information when I go and I talk to um, senior citizens who grow a house, um, some of the housing developments. So we're representing the whole population. <clears throat> so that's why it may be a little different, but the information is all there with more. <clears throat> so we all have mental health. Agree or disagree? Let's do thumbs up if you agree, thumbs down if you disagree, thumbs medium if you're not sure. All right. Mostly thumbs up, right? Um, so, yeah, we would agree. Um, I think for a long time, I, and still to this day, I've heard people use the terms mental illness and mental health interchangeably. And they're not the same thing, right? Not everyone has a mental illness, but we all have mental health. Um, I, once, I heard somebody in a training a few weeks ago say, oh yeah, my sister suffers from mental health. Would you ever say, I suffer from health? Right? No, it doesn't work that way, right? So mental health is this sort of holistic thing that applies to all of us. And it exists on a continuum, right? From well to unwell. So just like with our physical health, on one day, today, I'm feeling pretty physically healthy. I worked out yesterday, I got enough sleep, I've been eating my fruits and vegetables, I'm well. On another day, well, maybe my seasonal allergies are acting up. I'm not feeling so hot, but I'm hanging in there. I'm not necessarily sick, right? But I'm dealing with a health challenge. Maybe down the line, oh, well, I've developed a pretty nasty sinus infection as a result of these allergies. I'm gonna have to go to the doctor. <laughs> you dealing with that? <laughs> yeah, it's rough. I just went through one, I feel for you. Um, but yeah, so I might need to go to the doctor. I might need to miss some work. I might need to take some time to rest. Or I could, maybe I'm an asthmatic, and all of these symptoms have led me to have a really severe asthma attack, and I need to go to the hospital and get some treatment and support in that way. So just like that spectrum exists for our physical health, that same spectrum exists for our mental health. Um, so one day, we're feeling good, we're doing all the things that we want to be doing with our lives. Another day, um, maybe I got dumped. It's happened a few times. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that I have a mental illness, right? Um, but I'm facing some challenge to my mental health. Maybe I'm crying for several hours and not able to get out of bed. It doesn't mean I'm sick, but it's still a mental health issue, right? Um, I could be somewhere in the middle. This is kind of where I see myself. Um, I'm diagnosed with a mood disorder and an anxiety disorder, but I consider myself to be in recovery. I have treatments, I have supports that I need to be well. So I have an illness, but I'm not unwell, right? And then there are times when things are getting more severe and more critical, when more supports are needed, and the person may need additional supervision, additional treatments or supports, or even a short-term hospitalization to make sure that they are safe and can work their way further back on that spectrum. So the reality is that every single one of us throughout our lives are going to move back and forth on this spectrum. The only difference between us is how far in either direction we move. Does that make sense? So looking at this continuum a little more, oh, let me see. Looking at this continuum a little bit more, um, there are things that move us along it, right, in one direction or the other. Um, so what do you guys think might be some examples of things that could move us to this end of the spectrum that are things that are in our control? What are some things, some choices we might make, some things that might be within our control that lead us to this end of the spectrum? Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Taking on too many big projects and Yeah. yeah. Did you read my mind? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What else? Not eating, sleeping, and exercising? Yeah, not taking care of our physical health. Right. Pat, can you think of anything? Being unwell? Crisis. Crisis, yeah. So how about things that are out of our control, right? People don't necessarily choose become unwell, right? So what do you guys think might be some of the things that are out of our control that Trauma. could lead us? Trauma. 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 Yeah. Death in the family. Death in the family, certainly. Illness in the family. Illness in the family. The epidemiology of chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, our wiring, so to speak, right? And a lot of that has to do with genetics. So the bottom line is there are things that we can do to be preventative, to protect us from developing an illness. However, there are some things that are out of our control too, right? Um, either environmentally or things that we've inherited. Um, so it's really not up to us whether or not we develop a mental illness or snap out of one, right? That's not really a thing. So we also look at mental health as a multi-dimensional construct. Um, who here has seen a chart like this before? It's a pretty commonly used um, methodology when looking at wellness. So you'll see on this side, we have the physical, emotional, and social. Um, those are the things that are usually included in the health triangle model that's taught in a lot of health classes to the students. And then on this side, we have the occupational, spiritual, and intellectual. Um, and these are the aspects of wellness that really develop um, as we develop our own identities and grow into adulthood, right? Um, so all of these different areas, we have choices we could make that can support our mental health. And if our mental health is not doing so well, all of these different areas could be impacted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unique for everyone, right? Someone's spiritual life could look very different from someone else's. Someone's occupational satisfaction could look very different from someone else's, right? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> spiritual doesn't have to mean religion. It says here, greater than self, meaning, purpose. Right? So it really can apply across the board. Um, occupational, regardless of whether or not someone is employed, they can have occupational wellness. Right? It's about the use of their talent and skills. Um, so all of these different pieces are part of our wellness as a whole being. So there is no health without mental health. It's right? all encompassing. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease, right? Just because we don't have a diagnosable disease or disorder doesn't necessarily mean we're in perfect health, right? 
right? Wherever we are in that spectrum could fall into that category or not. <laughs> so we're talking a lot about illness, a lot about presence of disease, disruption. Um, but <coughs> we want to remember that mental health disorders are manageable. Right? This is a manageable disease. There are people walking around all the time, living with these experiences, going about their daily lives and managing. Um, a mental health disorder affects a person's thinking, mood, and their behavior. And that's pretty much our whole life, right? The things we think about, the things that we do, the way that we feel. So a mental health disorder or a mental health challenge can impact all of those areas of our lives. Um, and it's defined by a disruption to the person's ability to work carry out daily activities, and engage in satisfying relationships. Um, so it's kind of an overused phrase at this point, but that live, laugh, love, right? Those are the things that are being disrupted by a mental illness. Um, the other three things we want to consider when we're trying to determine if something might be a mental health problem or something that could use some mental health support are severity, duration, and impact, right? So how severe are these symptoms? Am I just hitting snooze a few more times in the morning than I used to? Or is it really taking me a couple hours to get out of bed when I didn't used to? Um, duration. Did I get dumped and I'm crying in bed for three days and then I'm okay? Or am I really having a hard time getting through the day without crying for like over a month? Right? And then that impact. How much disruption is it causing to the person's daily life? Now mental health disorders can be mild, moderate, or severe. Um, and those criteria are directly correlated to how much disruption is being caused in the person's life. So a substance use disorder is a mental health disorder. Um, I'm happy to say that as a system, we're finally starting to recognize that. Substance use disorders meet the same definition, diagnosable, manageable, affecting thinking, mood, and behavior, and causing that disruption. So the only difference is that there is a recurrent use of alcohol or other substances leading to that disruption. And this is a stat that is cited pretty frequently that you'll see. One in five youth and adults in the United States have a mental health disorder in any given year. Um, is anyone surprised by that statement or think it might be higher or lower? So sometimes people think, God, I think it must, it's got to be higher than that, right? So one thing I'll say is that the statistic comes from what has been reported, right? So we know that there's a lot of shame and a lot of stigma surrounding mental health issues and even just the symptoms. A lot of people don't want to admit that they're struggling, right? So the reality is that these numbers may possibly be higher. And also, this is looking at any given year. Right? When we look at lifetime prevalence, how many people at some point throughout their lifetime are going to experience a diagnosable level of a mental health issue, that number is almost 50%. So we have a 50-50 chance of dealing with one of these issues ourselves at some point in our life. And that's not to be all doom and gloom and say, oh, half of you are going to suffer, right? That's not the idea. The idea is that this is relevant to all of us. Either we will experience this or someone we care about will. So let's start talking about it. Okay. So looking a little more closely at the numbers, um, these are the past year prevalence rates. So <coughs> how many people met the criteria for these disorders just within the past year. So approximately 18% of US adults have a diagnosable level of an anxiety disorder. Um, about 7% have major depressive disorder, 8% have a substance use disorder, and approximately one in three people with a substance use disorder also have a co-occurring mental health disorder. Um, so why do you guys think that link might be there? Why do substance use disorders and other mental health disorders come hand in hand so often? Self-medication. Self-medication, yeah, that's a big thing. So for many individuals, Access to alcohol or other drugs may be a lot easier than access to So we want this is how we deal with our problems. You go and you drink whiskey and you forget about it, right? So depending on where the person is at, both in terms of their privilege and access and in terms of their background and what is acceptable in their social circle may lead to that. The other side of it is um, there's a 
bi-directional link, right? So someone may engage in substance use as a result of dealing with a mental health disorder, or they may have been using substances for a significant amount of time that led to a chemical change in their brain to lead to a substance, or to, to lead to a mental health disorder. So it sort of gets you coming and going. So this is looking at um, prevalence among 13 to 18 year olds. Um, it's a little confusing the way they worded it. So lifetime prevalence among 13 to 18, obviously 13 to 18 is not the lifetime, um, but we're looking at of all adolescents who at some point in their life will experience a diagnosable level of a mental health disorder. So, um, and again, we're including mild, moderate, and severe. We find that roughly one in five 21% of adolescents are experiencing a diagnosable level of a mental illness that falls into the category of severe disruption. That's a pretty big number, right? An even bigger number is when we look at all types, if we include the mild, moderate, and severe. That's 46% will at some point in their adolescence experience this. And this sort of in-between area, these 24% that are not in the severe, we have to remember them, right? Um, it can be easy to not notice the students that that's going on for because they're not disruptive in class. They're not failing all their classes. They're not skipping school, right? Um, that was me when I was in high school. I had straight A's. I was in every uh, extracurricular I could get my hands on. I was also running out of chemistry class to have panic attacks in the bathroom. Right? Um, so, and that 24% that are not at the severe level are the ones that we can really help with early intervention. Right? Reach them before it gets <coughs> to this level of severity, before it gets to this level of crisis. Um, just taking a closer look at the numbers, um, we see by and large the most common prevalence rates for youth are anxiety disorders at 31.9%, um, followed by mood disorders, which would include major depression, bipolar disorder, other forms of depression at 14%, um, substance abuse around 11%, and then our behavior disorders, ADD, um, conduct disorders, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, those are at about 10%. Um, so these things are really prevalent. And they often co-occur, right? It's extremely common for more than one illness to be present at a time. Yeah. In addition to alcohol and drugs, can video game, like excessive video game, be a substance abuse? So I don't know if it specifically falls into substance abuse, and I'm not sure if I don't I don't spend my time reading the DSM-5, so I'm not sure if there's a, a label for that yet. But it is something that I'm hearing about more and more. So. At the end of the day, it's not so important for us to put a label on it, right, and say this is a video game use disorder, this is X, Y, Z, um, but to notice that there are behaviors that are causing a disruption in the person's ability to enjoy their life. So we may notice, like, this youth has become dependent on video games. Maybe this is a behavioral symptom of another illness. Maybe it's something all to itself. But the idea is that we're noticing that change and trying to provide support around that and are discussing our observations about that change with the young person. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's the thing I've been hearing more and more about. And yeah, lots of things we can form dependence with, right? Um, so, pop quiz. What is the median delay in years between the onset of symptoms and when the appropriate treatment is received. So median delay, meaning about half of people wait at least this long, the other half of people wait even longer. What do you guys think that midpoint might be? Shout it out. One year. One year. Three. Three. Five to ten. Five to ten. Seven. Five to ten. Seven. Ten years. Yeah. So half of people <coughs> wait at least 10 years to get support. Um, that's an awfully long time to be suffering without help, right? And we know that the longer it takes for a person to get treatment, the harder it's gonna be for them to have positive recovery outcomes, 
Um, and what we know is that in terms of lifetime prevalence rates, 50% of mental health disorders begin by the age of 14, and 75% begin by the age of 24. Um, I think that's why it's so crucial that we as school communities are talking about this stuff. Um, it wasn't long ago that the Mental Health Association reached out to an area high school and they had said, oh, we don't want you coming here and talking about depression because then all the kids are just going to turn around and say they're depressed, right? That was the attitude not long ago. <laughs> um, so as you can see, the tables have really turned. We're mandating that this be talked about in schools because we know these are when these things are developing. And if we don't have information about what this looks like, how can we know when to refer people to help or to get help for ourselves? When I was in high school, I thought I was just lazy and a bad person because of my mental illness. I didn't realize this was a thing. Right? So, there are some significant impacts of delayed treatment. Um, social isolations and challenges with relationships. Um, and that can create a vicious cycle, right? Um, if a youth is suffering from a mental illness and they're losing that social support, they're losing that safety net of people who could recognize that issues are happening, refer them to some help, um, and it just escalates from there. There may be an increase in school absences. Um, on average, they find by approximately 18 to 22 days. <clears throat> Lower academic achievement, and that can be as a result of impaired cognitive functioning, motivation, functional impairment. And up to 14% of youth with mental health disorders receive mostly Ds and Fs, compared to 7% of all children with disabilities. Um, so we find that academic performance is particularly impacted when it comes to mental health disabilities. Um, youth with mental health issues are three times more likely to be suspended or expelled. 44% drop out of school. Um, and then here we have a pretty staggering statistic. Um, and that is that one in 12 high school students do make a suicide attempt and one in six seriously considered. Um, so those numbers are pretty staggering, right? To me, when we look at this, this is a call to action. Youth are struggling, um, and it's not going away. Well. And we as the adults in young people's lives can arm ourselves with skills and with knowledge to be able to catch things when they're starting, um, reach people before they hit that crisis, right? And provide some support. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Not yet. Okay. So with adults, um, the effect of delayed treatment has a significant impact. Um, adults can face challenges maintaining employment and relationships, and you can see how that could further add to that vicious cycle, right? We have a lack of relationships, we're not able to support ourselves, we're not independent, that's detrimental to self-esteem, right? Creates this vicious cycle. Um, a loss of self-esteem and confidence an increased risk for involvement with the criminal justice system. Um, so I do want to make a point here. There is a really common myth out there that people with mental illnesses are violent and dangerous, right? That's something that we hear a lot in the media, in the news. Um, I mean, what do you hear about in the news when you hear about mental health issues? You know, a lot of what we hear about school shootings, right? That's a big thing, or mass shootings. Um, so the reality is that only 3 to 5% of all violent crime in the United States is perpetrated by people with serious mental illnesses. People with serious mental illnesses are 10 times more likely to be the victim of a violent crime than the average person. So that message that we get from the media is really backwards. Okay? Um, however, due to stigma, misunderstandings, cognitive impairments and functioning, um, and self-medicating with drugs, there is an increased risk of involvement with the criminal justice system. Um, there's an increased risk for suicide and substance abuse, increased risk for physical illnesses, um, and this impact on physical illness leads to adults with serious mental illnesses um, actually have a shortened life expectancy by 25 years on average. Um, so mental health really impacts our bodies. Um, and mood disorders, are the third most common reason for hospitalization in the 18 to 44 year old age group. Any questions about
Is there any kind of uh, multi decadal trend in the prevalence of these sorts of numbers and how often and how many kids are suicidal? Has it gotten worse, I guess, in the last 10 or 20 or 30 years versus mm -hmm. 10 or 20 or 30 years? Yeah. So based on the data that's been collected, it has increased. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. Um, on the positive side, I think we're seeing an increase in these numbers because it's becoming more okay to talk about it, right? We do have more people seeking help. We do have more people saying, oh, you know what, that is me. I have had that experience. Um, also, I would argue that it is becoming an increasingly difficult time to be a young person. Right, um, everything from social media, our social political climate, all of the things that are happening that stress us out. Right, I had to set boundaries about when I'm allowed to check the news. Um, all of that stuff impacts youth too. Right, they're paying attention. Um, so I think yes, it has increased in terms of its actual prevalence, and I think it's also increased in terms of its reporting. So mental health disorders are not always easy to identify. So that 10 years, that's a long time. Why do you guys think people may wait so long to get diagnosed or to get some appropriate treatment? Stigma is a big part of it. Stigma is a big part of it, yeah. They don't realize it's a disorder, they just think that's who they are or that it's a difficult time. Yeah. They'll go through. Yep, exactly. So these could be, having started from a typical reaction to something difficult, right? I'll use the example of me getting dumped again. Um, so if I get dumped and I'm really, really sad for a few days, that's normal. If my whole summer is ruined because of it, I might not recognize that that's an issue. I think that that's, oh, just because I got dumped and life is hard now, right? But it could be a real issue that's developed. What else? I just have a question related to that. Yeah. Um, so it made me think of is, is the nature of what is normal changing because of the influence of so many outside factors such as social media? Mm -hmm. and is there is there data to support that? Mm. Can Can you sure? So for example, you mean you hear of it's, it because perception of what is normal and uh -huh. normal is 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 based on what you see, mm -hmm. not reality. And so if I'm constantly connected because there is no disconnect anymore, mm -hmm. right? And I think mm -hmm. you reference that. So how do I identify what is normal and is there a correlation between that? Right, so, right. So yeah, so the messages someone might be getting from their peers about what is normal, like social groups where maybe everybody's kind of depressed and they're just correct. talking about it, um, or everybody's really happy and why am I not fitting into that? Exactly. Yeah, I think that definitely plays a part of it. <laughs> um, so when we think in terms of normal, I kind of hate that word, right, but right. in terms of a definition, right. what we're looking at again is that severity, duration, and impact. So has this lasted for several weeks? Is it causing a severe disruption and what the person would, what is normal for them? What would they normally be doing? Um, and, and yeah, how severe is it? Um, so what else? What else might people not seek out help? Yeah. Oh, I don't know why they would not seek help. Mm. They may not have access to mental health providers. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in Tompkins County, we have the great fortune of having two clinics in our county, very rare thing. They both have long wait lists, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for individuals who maybe have private insurance and have a really high deductible, seeing specialists might cost them $150. Counseling is best if you see them every week. Yeah, not happening for a lot of income brackets, right? Um, so yeah, financial barriers are really huge. Yeah, I think it's tied to stigma, but it's such a hard conversation to start for yes. anyone. For adults, it certainly is, and for adolescents, you know, who are afraid to even show who they are to the world. Yeah, you know, it's they're just at the point where they're really cutting down talking to their parents. Mm -hmm. with whom they've always spilled everything. Mm -hmm. And there really is no substitute really readily available unless another community has a practice of engaging in that level right. regularly. Yeah, so they might not know who to turn to. And starting that conversation is really hard. And, it's and like, I think to rely on going to a, a professional and have that be a fix it when there's no established relationship yeah. is yeah. really Recovery does not only happen in the provider's office, <laughs> right? If we only worked on our recovery for an hour a week, 
probably wouldn't get very far. <laughs> yeah, so those other supports are important. And when we admit, you know, I think I might be struggling with a mental health problem, for many of us, we're stepping into a great unknown. What I happens think that's now? That's why the 14 to 18 or 14 to 21 mm -hmm. age group, because they're just figuring out who are my people. Yeah. Or who, who they are. Trust. They don't even know who they are. Between right. Yeah. Right. Is this just who I am? <laughs> right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think another reason can be that, at least until recently, no one would ever stop and think that they would be able to fix their heart if they were having a heart attack or that they would be able to set their own phone. Mm -hmm. But we somehow had this idea that if I just think really hard or if I just try really hard, I can fix this myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. That's a great comparison. Yeah, we just like we can't fix our own heart if we're having heart failure, we can't just fix our brain if we're in a mental health crisis. It doesn't work that way. All the willpower in the world cannot cure a mental illness. So we have all of this information, misinformation and fear of stigma. Um, we talked about some signs and symptoms are normal human responses, like grief, right? It's normal for grief or trauma to knock you off your feet. Um, but it's when we have this severity, this impact, this duration that we may need to recognize this could use some more support. Um, other changes could be things that are really typical during adolescence, right? Um, I know all of my symptoms got pinned on puberty. <laughs> Mood swings, trouble sleeping, weight changes, all of those things are typical, right? Um, so we always want to be going back to that definition, that idea of disruption. How much of an impact is this having? Is this person um, no longer spending time with their friends they used to hang out with and they don't want to spend time with mom and dad, but they still have other friends and social activities? Or have they withdrawn completely? Right? What are these changes? Are they typical? Um, many people manage their symptoms until a crisis. Um, that is a sad reality. Um, the Mental Health America organization has this whole campaign called Before Stage 4, which is all about intervening before someone gets to a crisis. Right, catching them before it gets to that point. Um, people are unaware, have a lack of knowledge. Um, and genetic and trauma risk factors, um, they present, the person may think that their symptoms are typical, right? Um, so depression runs in my family. My parents displayed depression very similarly to the ways that I do. I didn't know it was depression. I thought that was just our family, right? So these things can be a factor. So looking at some of the specific signs and symptoms. So what we're really looking for are changes, right? Um, has this person changed from what was their normal beforehand? Right? So changes in appetite, eating too much or too little. Sleep, sleeping too much or not being able to sleep. Energy, does this person have a really low energy right now or maybe they're manic? Right? Maybe they have really high energy, and that comes out as them being really, really confident and robust, or really irritable and angry. Right? Um, in youth, it's actually more common for mania and depression to present as anger and irritability. And I think that's important for us to remember, because it can be a lot easier to show compassion to someone who comes to us in tears than it can be to show compassion to someone who's snapping at us and cursing at us. Um, so while it's okay for us to set boundaries and say that's not okay to talk to me that way, we also need to remember that it could be coming from that same place of hurt and deserves that same compassion. Um, changes in the person's social activities, their appearance. Um, some people when they're developing symptoms may lose interest in their personal appearance. Um, they may fall behind on hygiene routines, things like that. Um, their emotional state and their cognitive functioning, um, especially concentration, decision making, and memory. Um, and those three things are super important in school, right? Concentration, decision making, and memory. Um, one of the biggest stressors for me when I was dealing with my symptoms in high school was trying to figure out college. That's a huge decision that we put on young people that can be dramatically impacted by symptoms of mental illness. Product of typical changes in adolescent development they could be typical responses to different life events. Um, can you guys think of any life events that a person might go through that would elicit these kinds of changes? Getting dumped. Getting dumped. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> what else? Where have you heard that? <laughs> Changes that in the family, like some yeah. divorce or change happening. Yeah, divorce, a new baby might really mm -hmm. impact your sleep and your emotional state and your concentration and all those things. Yeah. Moving to a new school. Moving to a new school, yeah. Or a new job, right? If I suddenly pick up a shift work where I'm working at 4 a.m. every day, you might see these things change in me for a little while. So there are a lot of typical life events that could have this impact. So we want to really assess that impact. How is it impacting the person's safety, their relationships, their work and school life, the activities that they do on a daily basis, and their ability to do self-care, right? There are things that we do all the time to take care of our own mental health, whether we realize it or not. Whether it's blasting classic rock to deal with our road rage, whether it's eating a piece of chocolate at the end of a really difficult day, there are things that we're doing all the time for self-care. And when those things get interrupted, that's when this impact may be really significant. So we also want to consider the duration. How long is it going on? And are these problems being managed with coping skills? Um, someone may be dealing with a lot of issues with their emotional state, their cognitive functioning, but if they're using tools to support themselves and those tools are pretty effective, we don't need to swoop in and be their savior, right? They're figuring it out. So we can stay in contact with that person and encourage them to continue using those things, but we want to recognize that strength also. So we want to consider these things because some of these changes can be normal responses to a life event that we discussed. Pat, you got anything to add to all that? I'm putting her on the spot. She's nervous because she's back in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I would just never come up there now. As you're, I'm in awe of your teaching. Oh, me. stop. <laughs> <laughs> I've been teaching all day. So. <laughs> no, really. Just, you're doing so awesome. I didn't think of it. <laughs> um, so we do have some additional signs and symptoms that we can consider. Um, so these are a bit more of the social, emotional, behavioral things that we might see with some more specificity. So particularly with anxiety or depression or other disorders, um, feelings of guilt or anxiety, particularly those which are excessive and unfounded, right? Um, if I feel so, 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 so guilty that I forgot to call my sister back and I talked to her every freaking day, like that might be a little excessive. Um, phobic or avoidant behaviors. So, anybody here afraid of spiders? With good reason. Wow. Oh, no. <laughs> With good reason, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you can avoid spiders pretty easily, right? You, and if you see one, you can call a friend and have them deal with it, right? Strong um, you're, you're the friend. Awesome. Tough, strong yeah. wife. I'm a friend of spiders. I can be that friend if you, if you see one today. Um, <laughs> however, if your fear of spiders is preventing you from going outdoors, right? That's a whole new level of disruption that we want to pay attention to. Um, ruminating, I have to call this the hamster wheel brain, when we're sort of spinning our wheels on the same thoughts over and over and over again. Um, Self-criticism or self-blame. Um, ideas that may seem odd to us. And again, we want to think of context, right? Um, when I was in high school, my best friend was super obsessed with aliens. Um, she was all about Area 51, she was all about the aliens, like she thought it was so cool, really believed in aliens. Um, to some people that might be an odd idea, right? Um, but in that context, given her interests and who she was, it was pretty far for the course for her. Um, so we want to keep these things in context always. Um, new or increased use of drugs or alcohol. Um, that's something we want to look out for because, again, it could be that this person has turned to self-medicating. Also, this behavior increases impulsivity and can really impact the person's safety. Okay. Um, obsessive or compulsive <coughs> behavior. Can we give me some examples of those? Hand washing? So, cleanliness. And cleanliness. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Anything else? Checking the door in the lock. Yeah. Walking on one side of the hallway always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having your window blinds all at one level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say counting or having to have something happen a certain amount of times. 
Yeah, yeah. So these are all pretty common behaviors that could be considered obsessive or compulsive. Um, but again, we want to think about impact. Um, the training I was giving earlier today, someone gave the example of, oh, like they might want their desk to be just so, and if it gets disrupted, they have to fix it. So to some extent, that could just be preference, right? However, if that gets disruption, disrupted and that instills a fear panic response in the person, that's a more significant impact, right? That's a more significant level of disruption that could benefit from support. Um, other things to be aware of, impulsivity, risk-taking behaviors, feeling hopeless or helplessness, um, a neglect of responsibilities or loss of motivation, um, and of course, we want to be very aware of thoughts of self-harm or suicide. And again, we're always considering impact, duration, is this a change? Is there a greater intensity? And is there a reason, right? This could be not coming out of nowhere, right? Um, maybe someone just read a book with a character who was really immersed in all of this stuff and it's something that's on their mind now. Um, that makes sense, right? So where is this coming from? What is the reason? How much of an impact is it having on the individual? Any questions about that? So I will say this is sort of a crash course in what signs and symptoms could look like and some warning signs. Um, I do want to let you guys know that we're offering um, an additional, more extensive training called Youth Mental Health First Aid that's going to be happening during the week of spring break. Um, and I'm very happy to say that that training, which is an eight-hour course, is free. Um, we've received some funding from our parent organization to bring this to as many people as possible. Um, so April 16th and 17th, down at the library downtown, we'll be holding that training. Um, and back where Pat is, there's some flyers and information about that if you guys want to dive more deeply into these topics. So again, mental health is not just the presence or the absence of a disorder. We're a continuum of wellness. Um, all of us have the potential for wellness and illness. There are things we can control, things that we can't control, um, all of which could send us in one direction or the other. Um, so physical and mental health are also all affected by our environment, our biology, um, and our self-care, right? We all have a responsibility to our own health, to our own mental health. Um, there are some things that are in our control, right? Um, we'll talk more about self-care in a moment, um, but I, I guess I just want to hammer home Youth copy what they see, right? They might act like they hate us, but they still imitate us, right? I work with teenagers. Um, <laughs> so who here finds it hard to find time to take care of yourself in the week? A lot of us, right? Some of us maybe not so more much as others. Kids notice that, right? If we show them that it's not important to take care of yourself, they're not going to think it's important. So that's something that we really, I think, as adults have a responsibility to model both so that we can be our best selves to support them and take care of them, but also to show them, hey, this is part of adult life. This is part of our responsibility. And it can be enjoyable. I was talking to somebody who was just uh, teaching her five-year-old about having a nice, relaxing bubble bath with candles and not having it just be bath time, right? Um, so even at five years old, we can start instilling these things. Um, have this continuum. Um, so how can we support good mental health by practicing awareness and prevention? Um, so we talked about this a little bit earlier, but what are some specific things you guys think could fall into this category of awareness and prevention? So let's think about the flu, right? Um, when it's flu season, there are all kinds of things that fall into awareness and prevention. So how do you know when it's flu season? What, what's the awareness that happens? It's on the news to get your shot, you mm -hmm. get a reminder. Yep. We talk about it like everywhere, right? <laughs> Can you imagine if we talked about the risk of depression in winter as much as we did with the flu? Um, so we have all these things for awareness. Um, and then there's also prevention steps we take for the flu, right? How do you prevent yourself from getting the flu? Yeah. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. 
balanced diet, right, all of these things. Um, so they're really <coughs> just basic steps that we can take. So if we shift the lens to our mental health, what are some of the awareness practices we can have about mental health? Knowing some of your own life triggers, you know, in your work or your school schedule. Yes. And learning how to kind of plan your time and not overbook yourself. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of things there. I bet having that self-awareness to know your own triggers um, and time management, right? So making sure that we plan some time for self-care is really key too. Check-in, self-reflection. Yeah, yeah. Check-in, self-reflection. Um, journaling can be a really good example of a specific tool that we could use for that. Um, great. Um, so despite our best efforts, there are some risk factors and stressors that could move us towards becoming unwell. Um, so what might some of those be? We hit on this a little bit earlier, but what might some of those risk factors or stressors Definitely genetics. Genetics, totally. Totally. Poverty. Poverty, yes. <clears throat> Poverty is a big one um, for a number of reasons, right? We might not be getting all of the care that we need. Um, we might have difficulty accessing the things that we need to have healthy wellness. Um, and it can contribute to some serious ongoing stress and anxiety. Yeah. Childhood trauma. Childhood trauma, yeah, absolutely. Um, childhood trauma has a whole host of health impacts, not just mental health, but across the board. So we can tip to unwell, despite our best efforts. But the good news is, we can also work ourselves back to wellness through self-care. So let's hear from you guys. What are some of the things that you do to take care of yourself? Exercise. Exercise. What else? Eat well. Eat well. Sleep. Sleep. Sure. Healthy Sleep. hobbies. Healthy hobbies. Yes. Stay connected to friends. Stay connected to friends. Yeah. Connection is crucial. So we have some more ideas here. Um, relaxation and meditation are helpful for some people. Um, spending time with pets. That's when I hear an awful lot. What better confident than one who can't talk back, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> be creative, journal, do activities you enjoy. Step away. Uh, this is a hard one for me that I have to really make myself do, and sometimes my coworkers have to make me do. Um, <laughs> take a break now. <laughs> Just having a break is really beneficial. Um, disconnect from technology. I think probably one that many of us struggle with. Um, getting quality sleep. Listening to music, reading, staying connected with friends. Um, seek support from a supervisor. This is one I rely on a lot. Um, workplace stress is a huge thing. And part of the supervisor's role, in my opinion, is to support you through that. Um, and to just smile or laugh. Find a reason to. Watch a kitten video on YouTube, right? <laughs> when we do these things, endorphins are actually sent through our body. And it can provide us with some momentary relief, um, no matter what is going on. Did I hear, is there a comment, question? So consider adding reminders to your daily calendar to do something that helps you to de-stress and re-energize. Um, what we found is that these tools for self-care, these wellness tools are most effective if we can work them into our daily routine. If we're going days on end without a break or without doing something that we enjoy, we're going to run ourselves ragged, and then we're going to have to work even harder to get ourselves back on track. So some risk factors for mental health problems. Um, so ongoing stress and anxiety. Can you guys think of some sources of ongoing stress and anxiety for students? Tests. Tests. Trouble with peers. Trouble with peers, yeah. In the age of social media, right, bullying doesn't end when you get off the school bus. Going to college. Yeah. Overscheduling. Overscheduling. Yeah. yeah. Anything else we can do? Peer pressure, social acceptance. Mm hmm. Looking for social acceptance. And I heard parents. Appearance. Parents. Oh, appearance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
concern for their peers? What's that? Like concern for their peers who might be dealing with issues? Yes. Yes. And I think that that's part of why it's so important that we're teaching youth about self-care too, right? Peers are most likely to go to each other for support. It can be really easy to lose yourself in trying to support somebody else. So what I usually share with young people is, okay, so what are the things that you have to do to keep yourself well? All right, is this situation getting in the way of that? That's when it's time to maybe set a new boundary. Um, having multiple transitions. Um, someone who maybe is moving a lot from place to place, um, children who get placed from home to home, whether through foster care or you know issues within the family, um, a sudden or profound loss, environmental factors. What might some of those be? Overcrowding in the living situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, overcrowding. Lack of safety. Lack of safety. Yeah, if the youth or the adult is not living in a safe environment, that can create a risk factor, right? Food insecurity. Food insecurity? Food insecurity. Yeah, certainly. Yes. Um, homelessness and poverty, um, we talked about that a little bit. Learned behavior, um, one of the learned behaviors I had growing up with parents who also had chronic mild depression was you deal with your problems by sitting in front of the television and zoning out, right? That didn't serve me very well. Um, but that was what I learned. Um, seasonal changes, we don't know about that here, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost spring, we're getting there. Um, trauma or ACEs. Um, so we're not gonna go super deep into this, but um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably aware of the ACE study, um, but if you're not, I highly recommend looking into it. Um, it's about adverse childhood experiences. There was an extensive study that was replicated many, many, many times. Um, looking at the impact of childhood drop, trauma and difficult experiences in childhood on public health outcomes. So it looks at things like obesity, um, different types of physical illness, substance use, mental health, um, how all of these things can be impacted in that way. Um, so medical conditions, um, developmental delays and disabilities can be risk factors. A previous episode or existence of another mental illness um, mental illnesses very frequently co-occur. They often go hand in hand. Family history and genetics we mentioned. Um, chronic illness. Um, so we can imagine how this would contribute to some feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. And when I think about youth, it's not a particularly common experience for youth to be dealing with really chronic severe physical illness. So for a young person, that's an even more isolating experience because they don't really have a lot of peers who are sharing that experience. Um, substance misuse and sensitivity. Also, side effects of certain medications can increase a person's risk for developing a mental health problem. So those are all the risk factors, well, some of the risk factors. Um, a risk factor is just that, right? It's a risk. It's not an inevitability. Someone may have a bunch of these risk factors and be perfectly fine. Someone may have maybe just one risk factor and develop an issue. Right? Um, so none of these are a promise, and none of these are a life sentence of suffering. Right? Um, people may have these risk factors, they may develop issues as a result, they may not, um, but regardless of the risk factors present, there's always hope for recovery. There's always hope for tipping that scale back to wellness. So some of the protective factors. These are some things that we can do in prevention. Um, so early intervention super key when we're hitting that 24% that are not at the severe yet, right? Um, or who maybe aren't even dealing with a mental health illness, but we're helping them to build some coping skills so that they can get through challenges that they face. Um, economic security, availability of recreation. Um, when youth don't have access to a healthy, safe recreation, they still need recreation, right? Everybody wants to have fun. Um, so what do they do? Crazy stuff, like what? Fortnite. Fortnite. <laughs> so video games, right? That might be one. What else do we see? Risky behavior. Risky behavior, yeah. And then posting it. Drugs and alcohol, posting it, yeah. Engaging in social media. Healthy recreation, um, so that we can stay healthy. Um, having a safe community is a protective factor. Clear expectations. Um, who here has ever been asked to do something, but it wasn't really clear what the expectations were? Mm -hmm. Probably a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm. 
Is that stressful for you? Yeah. <laughs> so if we don't know what to expect from people who have authority over us, from our friends, our relationships, that adds to that ongoing stress and anxiety. If we have really clear expectations, that can support us. Um, structure is helpful. As much as you know, people may try to resist it, they actually really crave it, right? Um, community involvement, having a sense of meaning and purpose. Um, one of the things that has been found to be one of the most effective activities for people pursuing recovery is volunteer work. When we're in service to other people, we usually automatically feel better about ourselves and we have this sense of purpose. Um, healthy lifestyle choices, self-regulating skills we talked about a little bit, interpersonal coping skills, how can we keep our cool when somebody is really ticking us off or hurting our feelings, um, spirituality can be protected, um, feeling connected, a sense of self-worth, a secure identity, and having a variety of self-care activities. Um, I sometimes find youth who say, oh, well, I only have one thing that helps me, and it's this. Um, and maybe that one thing is something that's not accessible all the time. Or maybe it's something that is not particularly healthy to do all the time, right? Um, so it's encouraging people to sort of widen that toolbox. What other things can we do for self-care? So when is it time to ask for help? The three R's. So we'll get into this in a minute. Um, but what do you guys think? When is the time for someone <laughs> to ask for help? Or time to encourage someone to seek some help? When it's affecting your daily life. Mm -hmm. It's affecting daily life. And I would add, when the person isn't able to enjoy their life as a result of what's going on, right? You know, life isn't a bed of roses, but <laughs> I think we should be able to enjoy it. And if we don't have that ability because of what's going on for us, we could, there's support out there that we can benefit from. So we want to encourage help or seek help when our responsibilities, our relationships, and our ability to do the things that we enjoy are being disrupted. Um, so and these disorders are manageable. Healthy lifestyle choices, um, realistic expectations. That's really important. Um, yes, recovery, I really firmly believe, is possible for everyone. It does not happen overnight, right? It does not happen overnight. There are no quick fixes to mental health problems. Um, so having realistic expectations means understanding that, understanding that it's a process, understanding that you might not love the first therapist you see if you decide to go that route, um, and that it takes some personal responsibility too. Right? Um, recovery is a collaborative effort between the individual who's trying to recover and their support team. Um, having some flexibility is important. Um, I'll give an example. So I'm very fortunate that I work in the Mental Health Association where we all understand mental health issues very, very well. Um, and I get a lot of anxiety when it's time for me to leave the house in the morning. I'm very fortunate that I have some flexibility there. My boss understands that. And if I come in 15 minutes late, We've had that conversation. I can have some flexibility. She's not gonna be like, why the heck were you late this morning? Like, well, we've talked about this. I may or may not have had a panic attack before I left the door, right? <laughs> so having some flexibility and accommodation can be really helpful. Um, stress management skills that build resiliency, things that build our ability to bounce back when we've been triggered or hit something challenging. Um, a strengths-based toolkit. So people with mental health issues, um, a lot of the time, hear about the things they're doing wrong, the things that they're not able to do, their deficits, their disability, right? That doesn't really give the person anything to work with, right? It's just, oh, I'm broken and these things are missing. Well, it's not like I can go out in the garden and pick those things off the vine, right? That's not the reality. So what do I have to work with? What are my strengths? How can I build on that? Um, and a recognition of when professional support is needed. There is a lot that can be done with self-care. There is a lot that can be done with social support. There are some times when professional support is really what's needed to get the person to a place where they can be safe and work on their recovery. So how can we help others? Um, who here has ever gone to someone 
with a problem and you really needed to talk about it and they tried to give you advice right away. Yeah. If you haven't had that experience, good for you, that's great. Um, <laughs> is that a good experience? Was that particularly helpful? No. What did you need? Someone to listen to you, right? Um, so even with other adults, but I think especially with youth, our instinct is we want to fix it, right? And that could be coming from a very good place. That could be coming from empathy and compassion. We see this youth is suffering and we want to fix it. But again, there are no quick fixes, right? Um, and really what that young person may need is for you to just listen and be there and say, I see you, I hear you, right? Um, and when we're approaching someone, we want to use those I statements. I'm concerned. I care. Um, not, you weren't in class again today. What the heck is going on? What's wrong with you? Right? Um, it seems kind of glaringly obvious that those are not helpful things to say, but they come out of our mouths. Right? We all make mistakes. Um, and a lot of it has to do with trying to address things quickly. Um, share information and resources. Um, this is not the same as telling someone what to do. Right? Um, it's really beneficial if we can lay out the options that are there for the person. Um, I think with anyone, and especially with young people, if we told them to do it, they're not going to buy into it, right? Um, we know that people have better recovery outcomes when they're selecting the options themselves. They have some buy-in. They're more likely to stick with it. Offer practical help. Um, any ideas what that might mean? Practical help? Things that they have control over. Things that you have control over, yeah. So I think of, um, you know, when, some, when there's a, a loss in a family, right? What's the stereotypical thing? You bring a casserole, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of funny, but it, that's practical help, right? When someone's really struggling, they don't want to do dishes. They don't want to cook. They may have a hard time even eating. So by providing the casserole, all you have to do is stick it in the oven, and that person has something to eat. It's ready. It's there for them. Um, I think one of the most helpful things that someone ever did for me when I was in a depressive swing was my dishes, mm -hmm. right? Um, these little things that can be so difficult for us to keep up with when we're in acute symptoms that really add a ton of stress, right? The level of shame I had about my dirty dishes, I can't even begin to describe. So when a friend came in and said, hey, I'll do the dishes, and didn't judge me about how gross they were, <laughs> like that's really huge. And that's within our realm, that's within our skill set, right? You do not have to be a mental health professional to provide some support. Um, I'll give you a ride to the grocery store. Oh, you know, if you need me to, you can just, I'll, I'll call the phone company for you, give me the number, and I'll, I'll get that payment through for you, right? These practical things that we can help people with. Um, we don't want to guilt, threaten, or manipulate. So some examples of this might be, you know, I really wish you'd get your act together because you're making your mother so sad, right? I think I heard that one a bit. Like, that, that's not effective, right? That person may already be feeling a lot of guilt. Um, threatening things like, you know, if you don't cut that out, I'm taking you to the hospital, right? Sometimes not getting help is not an option, but there's a difference between making a threat where the intention is to scare and control the person and being honest about what the options are. Right? Um, engage in your own self-care. Again, we're modeling and we're keeping ourselves going so that we can be the best support possible for that person. And connect with others with lived experience. Um, I don't care how many books you read. If you haven't lived it, you don't have the full picture. Right? It's just the way it is. So that could be reaching out to other people who maybe you know are in recovery from mental health issues who are willing to talk about that with you. Um, it could be reading memoirs, watching documentaries about people in recovery, um, but trying to get that lived experience perspective I think is crucially important to looking at this as a holistic experience and really looking at this person as a whole human being. Um, don't stop at the DSM-5 if that's on your bookshelf. <laughs> Question on the, on, the yeah. on the practical health side of things, are you, I can imagine the kind of doesn't help if you go to that person and say, how can I help? What can I do, right? Is that, are you better to identify something for them? You know, kind of take that decision off of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, so we always want to put the person in the driver's seat, mm -hmm. right? Um, so 
I think you can take your cues from the person. It might be too overwhelming to answer that question. Um, it might not be, right? Um, someone could come to me and I would say, you know, I haven't been to the laundromat in three months because I just don't want to bring all my laundry on the bus and now I have four loads of it. Okay, I'll give you a drive to the laundromat, right? So the person may know what kind of help they would like or they may not. So you could share your observations in that circumstance. I noticed you haven't mowed your lawn in a few months. My nephew's mowing lawns, so you wanna come over, right? But I don't think you would really be doing harm by asking how to help. So here we have our guiding principles of recovery. Um, this is something that we're sort of using across the system to inform the way that we work with people and the way that we encourage people to be on that path of recovery. Um, would I maybe have a lovely volunteer who would like to read? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> uh, number one, hope that recovery is possible. Number two, a strengths-based approach is necessary for success. Three, person-driven approach empowers use of person-first language. Four, there are many pathways, must be flexible, free from judgment. Five, a holistic approach includes mind, body, spirit, and community. Six, support from peers and allies provides mutual support. Seven, support from relationships and social networks is essential. Eight, culture influences and guides recovery. Nine, respect promotes self-worth self and dignity. And 10, trauma-informed approach promote safety, healing, and trust. Thank you. So you can see how this is really about having a holistic picture, putting the individual in the center of that process. Um, and I think working with young people is particularly important for us to remember, right? Part, sometimes it's our job to tell youth what to do, right? Sometimes they really need that guidance. But as much as we can put them in the center of developing their own self-care, developing what works for them, <coughs> helping them to identify what wellness looks like for them, right? I can't tell Jimmy or Sally what it's gonna look like for them to feel well. They have to figure that out themselves, right? Um, so really helping them to be in that driver's seat. Um, I do wanna make a note real quick about this idea of person-first language. Um, this is about looking at the whole person and not just the label, right? Um, if I have a family member, let's say I have an uncle who has asthma, it's not very polite for me to say, oh, Uncle Jimmy the asthmatic, right? You probably wouldn't refer to him that way. Um, very common for somebody to say something like, oh yeah, Uncle Jimmy's a schizophrenic, right? That reduces the person to a label, to a set of symptoms, to a DSM-5 number, takes away the whole person. So there's a really subtle shift that we can do in our language that just changes the way these conversations come out. And that's by literally putting the word person first, right? My Uncle Jimmy is a person with asthma. My Uncle Jimmy is a person with schizophrenia, right? Um, it's not my cousin Sally the addict. It's my cousin Sally is a person with a substance use disorder, right? Just shifting our language in these subtle ways can really change the way that we have these conversations and the way we think about these so any questions about all of that? Right, so we wrap up here. Um, just a little information about the programs and services that we have at the Mental Health Association. Um, there's a lot more information back there at the table. Um, but we offer a lot of peer support services. So that's individuals who have lived experience with mental health issues, supporting other people who are going through those experiences. Um, so we have a drop-in center that's called the Jenkins Center. Um, and that's available for adults. It's open Tuesday through Friday from 9 to 6, Saturdays from 12 to 4. Um, anybody can just walk in, you'll find some friendly faces. There's a lot of different spaces to hang out in. There's an activities room, there's a room with pianos in it, and there are support groups that happen there, but also activity groups. Um, I lead an art journaling group, just to give an example. Um, we have peer support, respite, and recreation opportunities for youth. 
Um, and I did want to share, we have one program that's going to be starting very soon on April 3rd that's called Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Um, that is a program for adolescents that puts them in the driver's seat, right? Um, it gives them a framework to figure out what they look like on those different stages of the spectrum and how they personally want to respond. What are the things that I need to do to be well every day? What are the things that I need to do if I'm triggered? What do I want that to look like? Um, so that's a 12-week program, and it's sort of a peer support and workshop program. There's some information back there. Um, we also have a drop-in group for adolescents. Um, and Pat, can you tell us a little about family support services? <laughs> Put you on the spot. So family support services, that also a spectrum of things that we do. There is two on staff who are um, peer specialists. There's two family peer specialists on staff. Um, and we do all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of family interventions. We also do a family rap group. But Melanie was telling you about the, the teen rap group. We also do that for families. <clears throat> we also do that for individuals. We, uh, we offer um, support groups. <clears throat> for families and individuals. Um, I'm the one, or we're the ones, that we go to. We're often at the area schools advocating, navigating with a parent during an IEP meeting or 504, um, going to a superintendent's hearing with them, going to court, helping them through CPS um, situations. So the whole gambit is meant Melanie does a, a group at the YMCA um, for the kids with um, special needs, and I often go there on Saturday just in case a parent needs some extra advocacy. Mm -hmm. We offer a, <clears throat> um, a many, <laughs> I just, um, when, there's a when there's a conference going on or a workshop going around in the area where I think it would benefit a parent to attend, we try to get them there somehow by offering transportation or I often go with them myself. Just out there. Out there is their eyes and ears. We also, I also do um, an intervention, community cafes, which is relatively new. It's been around for a couple of years, but we're, we're finally getting out to the rural areas and doing, instead of a family support <clears throat> group, we're doing it in a, different, in a different setting, in a different array by doing a socialization and then going through and doing a community focus, whether that be uh, how can we help our kids in school with bullying. So it would be a whole community cafe around that setting. And we would sit there and talk about that, go in small groups and put things together. And we have a harvest. And harvest is putting all of our ideas and all of our resolutions and our concerns and our suggestions all in one pile. These community cafes might take two or three times to come up to um, a solution. But it's impacted people and it's approaching those concerns and those things differently, which is working out really well. And I hope to do one in Lansing very, very soon. <clears throat> about. So, and it sounds like, especially with the cafes, it's also about building supports between families. Yes. Too. Like, this is a whole community, right? There are families who are having shared experiences, and how can we empower them to support each other as well? To be the liaison, uh, to help different areas around Tompkins County uh, start a parent support group in Enfield, start a support group in Dryden, and move on. Let the parents um, be their own mm -hmm. guidance. <clears throat> so um, we also have advocacy services. Um, we have uh, an advocate by the name of David Bulkley, who does the majority of the individual advocacy for adults. Um, but Pat and our other family peer advocate, Charles Niven, do this a lot with families. Um, and this is about making sure that people's voices are heard, <coughs> right? So whether that's with a provider, whether that's with a landlord, whether it's DSS, or going to Albany and talking to legislators and saying, hey, we need mental health education in our schools. Um, that's training that we offer. Um, so there's the standard adult training, which is for just the general community. 
Um, there is the Youth Mental Health First Aid, which is what I mentioned um, will be coming up in April, and that's for adults who are assisting young people. We have a higher education variation of that training that we've been taking up to Cornell University. And we just recently started offering a training that is specific to um, people who work with older adults and those dealing with late life issues that we've been dealing to um, bring to some long-term care workers and people in that sector. Um, we also can offer information tabling at events and come into classrooms and workplaces and just give presentations to promote mental health and wellness. Um, so we're here. We're a resource in your community and I'm happy to so some additional local resources to be aware of. Um, so for crisis, suicide prevention, and after trauma services, we have Suicide Prevention and Crisis Services. Um, they're a really fabulous organization. They do a lot of education in our community, a lot of trainings. They have a 24-hour hotline. Um, they also, I do want to make the point that they're there for any kind of emotional crisis, right? A person does not have to be having thoughts of suicide to receive help from these guys. Also, you can call these guys if you're worried about a friend in crisis. They're there to offer guidance and support. Um, they also have services for people who may have dealt with a recent trauma. Um, they have an after trauma services program where people can receive eight free sessions of counseling to process the trauma. Um, that's a tremendous resource that's available in our community. Um, and they also have support groups. We have our two mental health clinics listed here. Um, I will say, this isn't on here, but um, in terms of seeking private providers, psychologytoday.com is like the best tool ever. Um, they have a searchable database where you can look at specialization, insurance, all of that kind of stuff. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, for peer support and advocacy, we mentioned the Jenkins Center. Also, Finger Lake Center Independent Center offers peer support and advocacy for people who are dealing with mental health or other disabilities. Um, and then for family members and loved ones of people who may be dealing with a mental illness, we have Finger Lakes NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mentally Ill. Um, they have, I think it's, is it twice a month, Pat, the Family Forum? I'm sorry. <laughs> NAMI Family Forum, is that twice a month? Yes. All right, yeah. So they have a meeting Good. twice a month down at the mental health clinic where families come together and talk about these issues um, and everything from just mutual support, advocacy, all of that kind of stuff. Um, we can be a really great resource, and their information is available online also. Um, there is a list at that table back there that is a laundry list of local resources that pertain either directly to mental health issues or may intersect with a mental health issue. So that's all we got. Thank you guys so much for being here with us um, and you know, having these conversations with us. I think this stuff is crucially important, and I'm always really energized to see these rooms fill up because um, I think it's the time is now to talk about this stuff, right? So I'm glad to see you all here. Um, any questions? Well, Pat and I will hang out for a little while longer if anybody wants to come up to us individually and talk about anything. Um, if not, our brochures are back there as well. Um, our role as your trainers does not end now. So if you have any questions, you want to know about more resources, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'll be happy to assist. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.